Hi, Founder fans. Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day Week in Review. And you may have noticed, and I'm sorry if this makes a bad noise, that ah, things are a little bit different this week. I put a whole lot of work into this channel. It's not completely done. You'll notice it doesn't say Founder of the Day. So a quick announcement. Uh, I put a lot of work into Founder of the Day this week. You might have noticed that sweet countdown right at the beginning. Yeah, that took a while. And biggest announcement before we get started, and we'll get right into it, but I finally got all the pieces worked out where I can do professional, legitimate looking interviews right here on this channel. Now I have not done yet. I have done two, one with my spouse and one with my father, which if you're interested, I am going to put them up later this week on Patreon. So if you want to support the channel, head over there to watch that. But coming soon, I will be doing interviews with many people throughout the Revolutionary War who will help us learn about other founders. So thank you for your patience. It's been a few months in the making. It's the biggest news of my life. I've learn how to use computers essentially to do it, but I don't want to waste your time. You guys want to learn about American founders. So let's do it. I'm Jason. If you're new here, this is uh, where I talk about the last seven articles I published on my website, Founder of the Day, where I publish five new articles each week and two fun ones on the weekends. Follow me on all the blah, blah, blah down below. So let's talk about today's, and thank you for coming guys. First founder is Samuel Thompson. Samuel Thompson is an interesting character that I, I ran into along the way while I was researching uh, a Dr. Waterhouse, who we will be discussing a little bit later today. Now, uh, Samuel Thompson was from New Hampshire. He came from a relatively poor, or I, I should say average family. Uh, he was expected to become a farmer like the rest of his family and inherit his parents' farm. But he took to learning about medicine at a very young age, and in fact, in fact, uh, he's doctor, um, I'm sorry, a local medicine person who were called root doctors showed him the ropes of being a root doctor. Uh, and when I say root doctor, from my understanding is just people who were able to cure diseases and ailments with modern medicine. So uh, as a, uh, Thompson did learn this, but he didn't take up the practice for quite a while until he fell sick and was able to cure himself. Uh, I, I believe it was his mother was ill and he was able to cure her. And if I'm not mistaken, also his wife. And it was when his uh, wife, he was able to cure his wife that he finally said, I'm going to start doing this full time. And Thompson essentially from there started doing medicine full time. Uh, he had a, a, a several step process, which basically the idea was to make yourself. And I see you guys talking about tea down there. Uh, make make the body heal itself. So you would take a little something to induce vomiting. You would take something else to clear the bowels and you would take something else to sweat a lot. He actually made a little saunas essentially to help people ease out of the pores. Now, uh, at the time this was fairly controversial because this was just some dude from the woods who uh, learned some backwood medicines uh, and all the real doctors, or I shouldn't say all the real doctors, the slight majority of the real doctors, real doctors, didn't like this at all. Hi, Matt. Thanks for coming. So he didn't like this at all. Uh, he was he was promoting, hey, you can grow this stuff in your own garden. It'll help you feel better. And uh, it, it was not, you know, like I said, take it to so kindly by absolutely everyone. But there was a surprisingly large amount of people who did like this. Uh, you know, the fact that it was more holistic medicine and they called it botanical medicine, but a lot of the holistic medicines we have today, uh, their acceptance in the, you know, uh, 20th and now 21st century, a lot of that seems to stem from Samuel Thompson's medicine, which was called Thompsonian medicine at the time. If you ever run into that, this is the gentleman, this guy, uh, this fine looking fella. Uh, he's the one that this comes from. So, uh, What's really interesting about Samuel Thompson is, first of all, uh, when he was putting out his medicine, he had like a factory where he would craft it himself. I know it started out uh, just being something you could take from your own house, but he ended up making his own little brands there, selling them. And he was very uh, attached to what one might call uh, patent, patenting the medicine uh, for two reasons. First of all, he didn't want people making money off his program. And second of all, he didn't want people claiming to have, be using Thompsonian medicine, but making up their own stuff and getting people sick. Because yeah, as with any medicine, if you do it wrong, you can get people sick and even kill people. And he uh, certainly did not want that. Now, in Massachusetts, uh, where he ended up moving, they started making 
laws in the in the early you know the 18 teens i don't know what that's called not the 1820s uh the 18 teens I, oh the 1810s that's how you would say it probably uh, in the 1810s uh the laws came out in several states but notably in massachusetts that basically made it illegal to practice medicine if you didn't have a certain license which you know we're accustomed to today but at the time was a fairly uh I don't want to say radical, but a new idea. And it was done primarily to halt uh, the the growth of Samuel Thompson. So, uh, a really interesting gentleman. Uh, he ends up going on later to be primarily an author and writing about this for quite a while. Uh, so that's Samuel Thompson. Uh, I am noticing, I, I see some flipping over here. I, I forgot to mention at the top, like I said, I've made a bunch of changes. I'm using a brand new program. I think my volume should be better, so please let me know if the volume is good, if it's too loud, is it crackling? Would love some feedback on that. And I see a little bit of uh, popping over here, and, and uh, I, let me know if you're having trouble with the view. This is supposed to be a very good program. It's I've been able, like I said, I'm going to have interviews coming because I'm using it. So uh, let me know what you think. Uh, I see a question coming in. This is where I need your help, guys. Uh, which one would you think would be the most successful, Adams or Jefferson? Uh, I'm sorry, Miss, but I'm not understanding your question. Uh... I have not read the whole conversation. You guys are having quite a conversation. Um, anywho, let's go on to the next founder. And I'm going to remember to do this whammy, Brutus. For those of you who are new here, as I say all the time, uh, every Friday for a year, I was a year and a half, I was publishing reviews of the different Federalist papers. Uh, now I have moved on to the Anti Federalist papers. And we are discussing Brutus. And we are up to Brutus number three. Brutus number three, published November 15th, 1787, was uh, about representation under the new proposed at the time United States Constitution. Uh, again, probably written by Robert Yates, though we're not entirely sure who wrote it. Probably Robert Yates. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Rob, Bob, Bob, Bob. So he says a few things. First of all, he's talking about representation, and he first talks about slavery, which is really interesting. And I want to read you a quote from Brutus. And it's, it is this, quote, uh, talking about slaves were, quote, held in bondage in defiance of every idea of benevolence, justice, and religion, and contrary to all the principles of liberty which have been publicly avowed in the late glorious revolution. End quote. Now, uh, I... I like this quote for several reasons. First of all, because well, people nowadays like to point back and say, you know, why, why weren't they hypocrites having slaves but talking about freedom? And it's some of them, <laughs> not all of them. Uh, and and certainly Robert Yates, probably Robert Yates, probably Robert Yates, who was Brutus, certainly uh, does not seem to have liked slavery. Now he comes at slavery. And he talks about the three-fifth clause, which we probably all know. But as a reminder, the three-fifth clause said, uh, you know, essentially citizens get counted as one person and you count three-fifths of all other people, uh, uh, specifically meaning slaves. Robert Yates comes at this from two angles. First of all, he says, well, you know, if they're not, if you're only counting a slave as three-fifths of a person, can I count if you consider slaves to be property and you're counting them as three-fifths of a person, can I count my, like, land as three-fifths of a person? Like, if you're counting your property, why can't I count mine? So, they're either people... His argument is they're either people or they're not. Obviously, Robert Yates thought they were. Uh, but the slaves are either people or they're not. Uh, because they're not going to be represented in the government. So if you're counting all these slaves as part of your population, but only the white people are getting represented, that means that the white people are getting overrepresented in south, southern states like Virginia, South and North Carolina that have so many slaves. The, the, you're, you're just trying to get more Virginians than you really deserve. That is, if you think slaves are not really people. Uh, I hope you follow me here. It's a little bit convoluted. But it moves in nicely to the next idea, the House of Representatives. Because Bruce is talking about a free government, uh, how in a free government, in his opinion, the people are, so you're supposed to be able to look at the representatives in the government and get a good picture of the people themselves. So if there's 80% of the population are farmers, you should be able to look at the representatives in the government and say 80% of the representatives are farmers. 
So therefore, 80% of the population must also be farmers. Now, that's, of course, uh, you know, not necessarily a 100% hard and fast rule. It's just a general topic he, he puts out for foreigners who come, they should be able to look at the government as a reflection of the people in a free Republican society. Furthermore, uh, he starts talking about how the best way to do this and have the government reflect the people is to have less, uh, a smaller government is the only way, and it's a, a constant argument of the anti-federalists, is the only way to have a Republican type of government is to have a government that only encapsulates a certain amount of people. Because his example is, at the time, the first United States House of Representatives was going to have 65 members in it. But they were replacing 13 governments who had 13 different houses of representatives, which totaled approximately 2,000 representatives. So you were already taking a government that, you know, you're basically taking a government of 2,000 representatives and shrinking it down to 65. And according to Brutus, that was not acceptable, <laughs> not cool. Uh, and then he moves on to the Senate. And Brutus says, why are there equal representation in the Senate? Why is it that little Rhode Island gets the same amount of say as big old Virginia? Shouldn't, you know, a state with more population have more say? To be fair to James Madison, when the Virginia plan was originally proposed at the Constitutional Convention, James Madison did think that's how it should go, and it was a long discussion that was ended at the Connecticut Compromise, uh, which gave us our modern format with uh, rep representation based on population in the lower house and equal representation in the Senate. Again, uh, although that was a compromise, a necessary compromise to get the Constitution created, it was still, there were people not happy about it, notably Brutus. Um, and that's a general overview of this one. There was There's a lot of fun stuff in it. Again, there's a link to read it for free in my article if you are interested. Um, I see so many comments coming through, which I absolutely adore. I am sure I'm going to miss some things. I wonder where they started minimum uh, requirements for medicine. It was a little bit later. They tried to start doing it now, Troy. Um, yes, Brutus did a very good job. He always does a very good job. <laughs> Big Brutus fan over here. Uh, Jefferson, okay, you guys are having a little side conversation. Uh, this one, again, as I said, uh, I want to kind of keep this one as lectury as possible and get through it in an hour. Uh, and if you guys want to chat, first of all, I forgot to put a link in the Discord channel, but I think most of you are in there. If you're not, let me know. I'll be happy to hook you up with the Discord channel uh, where we talk about stuff like this all the time and yada, 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 fun times. Let's move on now to whoever is next. Alexander Scammell. As I've been mentioning, over the weekends I published two old articles because I feel bad for them. They're left in the past and I've written so many. So I, wrote, I republished Alexander Scammell this week. Now, Scammell is a really interesting character. Uh, he was a young man, um, uh, he was a young man who in New Hampshire was uh, joined the militia that participated in the Battle of Fort William and Mary. Fort William & Mary is arguably one of the several arguable first battles of the American Revolution. It took place in December of 1774, just a few months before the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which is really inarguably the first battle of the American Revolution. Uh, but Fort William & Mary had a lot of commonalities that you would later see just a few months later at uh, Lexington and Concord. Notably, Paul Revere got on his horse and rode out to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, saying the British are coming, the British are coming, although he didn't actually say that, but warning them that the British were coming to take the powder from the fort. And so what, just like what would happen a few months later. And so what the Patriots did is they removed, they went to the fort, took it with very little fight. I think there was one shot rang out, but, and they beat up a guard. I'm, I'm not, mis I don't remember the exact details of the fight, but it was fine. <laughs> there was no blood, barely any bloodshed. They went and took the fort and they took the gunpowder. And then the next day, more Patriots came back and they took some of the cannons. And that was essentially it. Cause then the British showed up and it was all gone. And then they pretty much left. Um, but I bring this up because this is how early Alexander Scammell had gotten on board with the American Revolution. Again, he was still a young man at the time, but he joins. Uh, he's, he works his way up and becomes an important member of the com uh, community, the Continental Army. 
to the point where he is chosen to replace Timothy Pickering as adjutant general of the Continental Army. And as a reminder, an adjutant general is, first of all, a word I can probably not say right. It's very difficult to get out. But uh, also, it's kind of an administrative role. It's almost like he was the CEO of the Continental Army. Though, of course, that's tough because George Washington is the CEO, and he was never a major general or anything like that. He was just doing the operations, running the business of running an army. Uh, interestingly enough, it was during this time that a gentleman named John Andre was caught for being a spy and trying to get Benedict Arnold to change sides, as he most famously did. Now, John Andre, you may know, he was caught and is the one who kind of gave in on um, Benedict Arnold, but Andre is hung for his crimes. What you may not know is the person chosen as his executioner was Alexander Scammell. And I have a very interesting quote here. Uh, Alexander Scammell, on the day of Andre's hanging, wrote a letter to Major John Andre that said, and this is the entire letter, and I quote, Sir, His Excellency General Washington has fixed the hour at 12 o'clock this day. I am, sir, your most obedient servant, A. Scammell, Adjutant General. And I will say, while that letter is extremely short, he abbreviated most of it. <laughs> uh, and then he um, pulled the pulled the pulled the did the did the thing, and executed Major John Andre. Uh, this seems to have stuck with him because everyone really seems to like John Andre. If you've seen Turn, while well, there are a lot of liberties taken in that show. The, there was a lot of truth to the John Andre character. He was a worldly man, and people really did like him. Um, he, uh, it must have stuck with him because just six weeks later, he resigned the position of, uh, adjutant general. Uh, he'd be, and, and the reason is he does want to serve in the war, but I have another quote here from George Washington himself, uh, in the aftermath of the, re uh, the resignation from, a not from the Continental Army, as we'll see, but from, uh, adjutant general, which says, I shall very reluctantly part with Colonel Scammell, as he has constantly performed his duty to my entire approbation and to the satisfaction of the army. George Washington, November 28th, 1780. Now, I know that's not the most greatest quote in the whole world, but it indicates just how respected Scammell was, even at the highest levels of power. I do see some questions coming in. I'll get to those in just a second, because we're coming to the end of John Andre, sadly. Uh, John Andre, uh, I saw your question, uh, Ashley. Uh, uh, we're coming to the end of Alexander Scammell shortly. Uh, unfortunately, Alexander Scammell, he goes to join the battle at Yorktown. And the Battle of Yorktown wasn't so much of a battle. It was more like a siege because it took several weeks. And uh, on Scammell is leading a scouting party uh, in the days leading up to the final battle of the war, um, Scammell's on a scouting party and he gets shot and then taken prisoner. Now his, <coughs> excuse me, Scammell's wounds are grave and the British actually release him almost right away because they're like, this guy's about to die. So they send him back to the Patriots and sadly he does die on October 6th, 1781. And then the Patriots win the war at Yorktown just 13 days later. He missed the victory by less than two weeks. And what's really interesting about Scammell, and I don't remember exactly who, but his name pops up a lot in the names of children of his friends. There are several Alexander, Scammell, blah, blah, blah. Alexander, and I'm, it bugs me that I can't remember. I like, I think there's like an Alexander Scammell Dearborn, right? And in an Alexander Scammell... I want to say Knox, but I know that's not right because Knox was already older by that point. So that's the story of Alexander Scammell, just a beloved member of the Continental Army who died, you know, sadly too young. Excuse me. Sorry, got to sip my water. I'm talking a lot. I do see some questions coming. Uh, I'm open to suggestions. Founding Fathers, watching your best bet. Um, not in on that conversation, guys. Thank you for having me. Though, without the compromise... What incentive was there for a small station? Oh, you're talking about Brutus Troy. Um, what incentive were there for the small states to join? Well, fair representation. Uh, in a way, the protection of these bigger states. 
um, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, uh, and just to be part of the union. But also, there was reason not to, <laughs> which is why they came up with a compromise. That's exactly the reason for the compromise, actually. Um, okay, uh, I thought it was pronounced adjutant. Adjutant. No, I'm probably worse, misfit, at pronouncing things. Um, why do people like John Andre? He just seemed to be like a really nice guy. <laughs> he was worldly, he wrote plays and poetry, he played music. He had polite conversation. He was brilliant. He was a high-ranking, uh, he was a major in the army, but still a, an important officer in the British army with the whole future ahead of him. A polite young man, uh, apparently a very, uh, uh, the, the, I'm trying to say the ladies were very attracted to him for many reasons. <laughs> trying to keep it clean. Uh, at his death, he was concerned of his honor. Yeah, like, uh, they were all concerned with their honor. So, yeah, uh, war with Britain, something like that. John Andre is a cool cat. Um, I'm not going to get too off track with John Andre there. <laughs> want to keep it under an hour, and I don't. Oh, I do have a time in my new thing. It's not recording. I'm assuming this is recording to YouTube. Again, new program. Hopefully it's working out. Let me know what you think. Um, 23 minutes. Okay, I take one more sip of water. I got a, I'm a little choky today. I got all choked up from that Alexander Scammell thing, huh? But right now, we're going to talk about treason. We're going to talk about Dr. Benjamin Church. Dr. Benjamin Church, during the lead-up to the American Revolution, his loyalties were always kind of questioned. Some people said... Most people said he was a fiery patriot who helped ignite the American Revolution, which is true. He did have a huge part in rousing the rabble in Boston. Some people questioned his loyalties, which is also true, because he was always real close with the royals and the governors. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why I sounded like Bill Cosby there. That was not intentional. But yeah. Scammel's still up. You got it. Thank you, Misfits. I think said it. Yes. There it is. There's Dr. Benjamin Church. That is a likeness drawn after his death. I will let you know. Uh, no known uh, picture from his lifetime. Um, Any hoozle. Where was I? <laughs> um, okay, Dr. Benjamin Church. People were like kind of questioning his loyalty, but he was there. Uh, after he, the third anniversary of the Boston Massacre, he gave the annual oration, which happened for the several years before the American Revolutionary War and several years after. It was a great honor. And he gave one of those speeches and helped get people get super strong. It is pretty scary. I will say that. Uh, and then the war breaks out. And Church is chosen to be a part of the uh, Provincial Congress of Massachusetts, which is kind of the revolutionary government. He's also a member of the Committee of Safety, which helps prepare Boston for a war. He helps to fortify and, and prepare the defenses for the Battle of Bunker Hill. And then he's chosen to go to Philadelphia, all the way to Philadelphia, to testify in front of the Continental Congress about the situation in Boston and about the best way to prepare for war. Uh, and then, and, and th this is after, again, already after Bunker Hill. So war's already broken out, but the best way to fight in Boston. So then he goes back to the Boston area and joins the Patriots. And again, at this point, he's already been on the Committee of Correspondence. He's a physician in Boston. So he's pretty much up there with Joseph Warren in, like, importance to the cause at this point. And he's given two positions by George Washington. He's part of the committee that welcomes George Washington officially. And he's given two positions by George Washington. I want to say them right, so I'm going to look at them. He has made the first Director General of the Medical Department and the first Chief Physician of the Hospital Department. So he is running both the medical and hospital departments of the Continental Army. Granted, at this point, the Continental Army is almost entirely in Massachusetts, so it's a little easier than later when things get spread out, but... If it has to do with medicine in the summer of 1775 in the Continental Army, Dr. Benjamin Church is your guy. He was overseeing the whole thing. And then suddenly, George Washington gets a letter. You see, Dr. Benjamin Church had a mistress. 
And he trusted this mistress with certain information. And he trusted her to take this information to General Thomas Gage, who was the mili military dictator of Boston, who was leading the people fighting the Patriots. This mistress, unfortunately for Dr. Church, was a Patriot. And she went to another one of her lovers because she was a popular mistress, one might assume. And she gave this other one of her lovers the correspondence from Dr. Church. Now, this other person was in the Continental Army, and he brings it back, and it makes its way to the hands of General George Washington. George Washington reads it. It says, what's going on here? And uh, he confronts Church and said, hey, you're supposed to be one of our top patriots. Like, what is this? And Dr. Church try says, well, I was trying to give Gage false information to make him think we had bigger numbers than we do. And George Washington was like, that kind of thing goes through me, buddy. You don't get to make decisions like that. <laughs> and uh, Church was actually tried and convicted of treason and held in prison for a little while. And then he is pardoned, he's paroled, and they say you can go be a British. Like, we know you're being British. And to be fair, a hundred years later, they would find in Thomas Gage's letters, they did find proof that he was being a traitor and giving Thomas Gage accurate information. So, they let him go side with the British, and this is where things get strange. Dr. Church sets sail for the Caribbean, and his ship is lost at sea. Story's done. Usually I'm a bit sadder when that happens, but again, this guy was, uh, being a traitor, which I'm just realizing two in a row <laughs> with that John Andre stuff in there. So I cannot possibly stress how important it was. Like we talk a lot about Benedict Arnold and his treason. And that was the single most important treason of the American Revolution without a doubt. Because, you know, Benedict Arnold at that point was a, a battle winning hero to many. But in the first summer of the American Revolution, when they're still cobbling together this makeshift army, one of the top guys, the doctor, is a traitor? That is very difficult to stress how big a blow that was to the morale of the Continental Army. It doesn't get any better, because then they appoint John Morgan, who is fighting with uh, William Shippen, and then William Shippen takes over for John Morgan, and... and the medical department is messy during the Revolutionary War. I have a pretty in-depth thing about the relationship between Morgan uh, and, and uh, Shippen on my um, uh, Patreon, if you want to check it out over there. Which, by the way, Shippen is also Benedict Arnold's wife. Oh, okay, I don't want to get I don't want to get too tied into Benedict Arnold and John Andre, but there is a tie there. Anyway. Um, okay, I'm missing some things over here. Uh, he was fairly young, still. Not that much older than me. Um, let me take, uh, Illuminate. Is it Illuminati? I think that has an I in the end. FYI, Matt. <laughs> okay, anyway, so that's Dr. Church. Let's, uh, let's take a peek over here. What's, what's this? Nope. What am I? Okay, anyway. Anyway, figuring out my new setup. Got a new setup, figuring it out. Uh, Dr. Church, we go over here to Stephen Price. I mean, I'm nice and pink. That's a bright. This is a lot more fun. <laughs> I'm getting good at the thumbnails, too. By the way, I, I mentioned on the Discord, if you guys like my new thumbnails I'm doing, they're a little bright and fun and not super revolution colored, but mm, trying to get clicks. <laughs> so, you guys want to talk about uh, the Hamilton duel for a while? Sure. Not that one. Not that one. We're going to talk about the kids' duel. It is in the play Hamilton, for those of you who enjoy Hamilton. Um, but there is a whole part of that duel that's left out. Uh, his name is Stephen Price, and he dueled the day before. You see, in the play Hamilton, uh, they don't make a big deal about the friend hanging out with Philip Hamilton when he uh, gets into a duel with George Eaker. Now, basically, Stephen Price graduated from... King's College a year before Philip Hamilton and they were friendly. And Philip Hamilton and Stephen Price don't like a speech George Eaker gives and they're both, uh, one's 19, Price is 20 at the time. And George Eaker, um, he's like 27 or so 
and he's in his box trying to watch a play at the Park Theater in New York City. Keep that in mind. That's going to be important in this discussion. So Price and Hamilton go in there, and they're talking trash about Eker real loud. And eventually they're like, hey, let's just go outside. And Eker's like, calm down. Like, what are you guys freaking out about? Like, I gave a speech several months beforehand. It was a July 4th speech, and this is late November. <laughs> what, what are you guys talking about? Uh, and Philip Hamilton and his friend Stephen Price were being kind of jerks about it. And eventually, uh, George Eker challenged them both two duels. Now, in the play Hamilton, Eker gets into a duel with Philip Hamilton, and they omit that just the day before, George Eker was in a different duel with Hamilton's friend, Stephen Price. So, I believe it was November 20th, they go to the theater and talk trash. November 21st, the next day, Stephen Price and George Eker duel. Four shots are fired, no one's hurt, they shake hands and call it a day. The next day, George Eaker goes back to the dueling ground. This is two days after the first incident, the day after he was already in a duel with Stephen Price. Then he duels Philip Hamilton, and this time, he's over it. <laughs> like, he was just in a duel. Bang, bang, bang. Sorry, Hamilton family. One of you's got to go. <laughs> and, um, excuse me. And that was the end of Philip Hamilton. George Eager, by the way, was a pretty good guy and would go on and would die just two or three years later uh, while serving as a volunteer fireman. He caught pneumonia. So, and again, he was the one in his box who these young kids came talking, these teenagers were talking trash to. So, I know there's a lot of hate for George Eager out there, but he wasn't really that bad a guy. Um, was a friend of Aaron uh, Burr, though. Uh, Troy, I'm going to stop you right there. Uh, duels 2, Hamilton 0. That's not exactly right. Uh, I forget how many duels the Hamilton family was in, but there were several. <laughs> and uh, the Hamiltons didn't lose all of them, just the ones we talk about. Um, and also, so was like his brother. I'm not, I don't want to get too far off track, but the brother in law, so we're talking about the play. I am going to get off track. So we're talking about the play. There is a uh, line where Angelica Schuyler talks about her husband. Uh, you know, first she's talking about how she has to marry rich. And later she says, I met a husband. He is not a lot of fun, if you remember that line. Um, she didn't marry rich. He was fun. When they married, he was living in America under an assumed name because he was running from debts in England. And then they, they eloped and ran off to France. So... Uh, John Barker Church, a very interesting guy, who's actually, it was his pistols that were used, I believe, in both Hamilton duels. I'm not 100% sure on the on the, the Philip Hamilton-George Eaker duel, but I am with the Aaron Burr duel. So, extra fun fact. Um, I wrote a book of love letters of Lucy Flicker Knox and Henry Knox. I'm a little behind in this conversation, I think. <laughs> uh, are you talking about Stephen Price? Let me know, Matt, because I'm a little... Okay, um, so remember how I said this all started at the Park Theater where uh, Eker was trying to watch his play? So Stephen Price was trained as a lawyer, but he didn't seem to love the law. So what did he do? He started investing in the entertainment industry. He started investing just a few years later in that same Park Theater where all of that started. In fact, by 1808, he had a controlling interest in the Park Theater and became the first theater manager in American history. Now, there were other theaters, there were people managing them, but for the most part, it was either an actor, a playwright, or um, one of the people directing the plays who actually ran the theater. But he is the first person to take a theater as someone who couldn't act, or didn't act, I assume couldn't act, didn't write anything, had nothing to do with production. He just owned the theater and hired the actors as employees. That is how it works today. <laughs> like, very few theaters are actually owned by the, the troupe that acts there as well. Furthermore, he started making connections in Europe because at the time, theater was generally performed by a troupe in repertoire. And basically, this means that, speaking of musicals, <laughs> basically what this means is the there were just actors who always worked there and they had, say, five or six plays they knew and they do one play for two weeks and another play for two weeks. And it was the same people in the same plays on rotation. 
And what Stephen Price did is Stephen Price started bringing over stars from Europe and putting on a show and say, I don't want to say one week only, but this month only, uh, blah, 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 Williamson, coming from blah, 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 England, performing in blah, 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 you know, Macbeth. <laughs> and and it would be, be the tickets would be more expensive, but it would have a bigger draw. And he continued to do this for several decades until he actually went to London and for a little bit um, uh, 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 was at the, uh, oh, the, the name escapes me, on Drury Lane. What's the theater? The Theater Royale on Drury Lane in London. He ran that for four years where he made even better connections and he started sending more stars over and started doing touring productions of his plays too. And much of what we think of as modern theater comes from this dude who... Uh, survived a duel that Philip Hamilton did not. <laughs> this duel who mysteriously is left out of a play from Broadway, and he happens to be the guy who essentially built the way we think about Broadway. Of course, the Park Theater was not on modern Broadway, but this was an extremely... Um, re he was revolutionary. You know, now we go to see a play, it's like, oh, Matthew Broderick's in, you know, 42nd Street. Oh, okay, Kim, is that? <laughs> I presume. <laughs> I don't live in New York City, you know. But I, you know what? That's not fair. I did live downstate, and I did go see... I'm going to brag for a second here. I did go see the producers when it was Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick. Yeah, I got to see that. It was amazing. And, and it was good the second time I saw it, too, but I went for the stars at this limited-time show, and I went there because Stephen Price. <laughs> uh, I'm missing a lot. I see people accusing Matt of <laughs> being, um, I guess, a 245-year-old man. <laughs> um, I don't think that's true. Uh, but speaking of Matt, we're going to talk about one of Matt's recommendations, Benjamin Waterhouse, right now. I'm going to change this while I sip my water. Got a lot of talking doing. So... Give Matt two shout-outs today, which, by the way, Matt, I should note, Matt got two shout-outs on Monday. I, I didn't think about ahead of time making a video on, uh, 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 not Francis Dana, um, uh, Rufus King. I didn't realize I was making a video about Rufus King and publishing an article about Benjamin Waterhouse on the same day until I basically hit send. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Matt's getting all the thumbs up today. <laughs> um, okay. Any all. Excuse me. Thank you for recommending Waterhouse, Matt. Especially because it led to the discussion on Samuel Thompson earlier. So either way, Benjamin Waterhouse was from Rhode Island. And he was a uh, apprentice to a physician. And what's really interesting is... Well, no, I'm skipping ahead. What's really interesting comes later. What's fairly interesting, uh, he was apprenticed to a doctor, which at the time, you could be a doctor in the young United States if you simply apprenticed to another one for a while. There were not a lot of barriers to entry, like I was discussing earlier with uh, Samuel Thompson. Although, uh, Thompson was kind of more of a pharmacist, but either way, it doesn't matter. So, Benjamin Waterhouse, in 1775, March of 1775, gets on a boat and sails to Europe to study medicine further at 21 years old. Now, this is March 1775, just before uh, the lockdown of Boston. And that's where he sails out of. And I did see someone... I did see it... He is... A, allegedly took the last boat out of Boston. I could not confirm this, so I didn't write it in the article. But I did want to put it out there. That's how close it was. He gets out just in time. Goes over to England. He studies in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Scotland. He studies in, uh, in London. And he studies in the Netherlands, and the name of the city is eluding me right now, um, but he's, he, so he studies medicine at three of the most prestigious medical universities in Europe, if not the world, at, during his time. Still, <laughs> like, still very prestigious medical universities. During his seven or eight years over there, he misses the American Revolution, but he does stay in a house with a gentleman who is representing the United States to the Netherlands, and that gentleman's name is John Adams. And while he's there, John Adams is already in his like mid forties, probably approaching fifty. Uh, John Adams was born in the thirties, seventeen thirty. Yeah, he's approaching fifty. 
this kid is like 26, 27 at the time, and uh, they get along swimmingly. In fact, Benjamin Waterhouse helps John Adams decide where to send his two boys to school. John Quincy Adams, a future president, Benjamin Waterhouse helped educate. And Charles Francis Adams, whose, uh, ed whose life ends decidedly differently, uh, he helps edu he not educate them, but choose their education because he already had some experience in the Netherlands before John Adams arrived. They live together for a time and become very close friends, and they have a lifelong correspondence, which, interestingly, I, I actually read that... Um, there's only about 300 surviving papers between the Adamses and the Waterhouses, and these papers show a very, very interesting uh, view of John Adams while he's acting as a minister in the Netherlands. Unfortunately, it seems like uh, Waterhouse's spouse, after he died, asked everyone to send his papers back, and she apparently destroyed them or they're lost. Uh, so we actually don't have as many Waterhouse papers as we should, though we did publish articles Throughout his life, so we know we know a good we know a lot about him, but we we don't know all that much about his relationship with John Adams. Either way, Waterhouse does come home shortly after that to America, and he gets put in charge of Harvard's first medical school and establishes one of one of the early medical schools in the United States. Of course, by this point, um, like the College of Philadelphia, which became University of Pennsylvania, had already had its medical school for several. I'd say two generations, uh, as I said. Earlier, we were talking about Morgan, John Morgan, and William Shippen. They basically started it together. Whole other story, again, on my Patreon page. Um, thank you for your support. <laughs> um, and he's a professor there for like 20-something years, but he's outspoken. He's kind of, oh, I forgot, when he comes back, he sails with Alexander Gillian, who was the uh, Commodore of the South Carolina State Navy. Uh, and he brought young Charles Adams back home. Charles Adams came home first. He didn't like Europe. Um, anyway. Uh, comes over. Waterhouse is in charge of the medical school. He educates a whole slew of doctors in the United States. And then in 1798, uh, Edward Jenner invents a smallpox vaccine. I know vaccines are very timely and seemingly controversial right now. Um, but... Edward Jenner invented a smallpox vaccine and sent it to, who else? Dr. Benjamin Waterhouse. Dr. Benjamin Waterhouse, he first writes his old friend John Adams, who doesn't respond quick enough, so he writes to Vice President Thomas Jefferson, who, when he becomes president, works with Waterhouse to promote the vaccinations and put them out and help people get vaccinated for smallpox, which was one of many, many diseases that were a scourge to Americans at the time. It could wipe out gigantic sections of cities. What's interesting is he does the same thing that Samuel Thompson did that we were discussing earlier. He had the vaccines, but he didn't want people to make their own and use them wrong because that could kill people. And he also wanted to make a big profit. So he had the only copyright, the only patent for these vaccinations for smallpox, uh, though he did, again, spread it out and help eliminate smallpox in the United States. You know, it would be, of course, another 170 years or 180 years before the world eliminated smallpox, but he was very early on this train. And I do want to take a side note. Um, they had inoculations at this point, but not vaccinations. I'm not a scientist. I'm not 100% sure what the difference is, um, but I do know vaccinations, I I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, inoculation is when you are given the disease itself and Va vaccination is when you're giving a, a variation of the disease that's a little bit different. For example, the smallpox vaccination was actually made of cow pox because you could give someone cow pox, they wouldn't die, and they would also be resistant to smallpox. And that's where the word vaccination comes from. Vaccine. Vac, I understand it, is, I think it's Latin. It's another word, it might be Greek, but it's another language. I believe it's Latin. Vac is Latin for cow. And that's where we have vaccinations from cows, literally. <laughs> so 
To wrap up Waterhouse, he made a lot of enemies. He was outspoken, he was crankety. He got too good at education in Europe, it sounds like, because he comes back to Europe and he just doesn't like being a small town doctor. He doesn't like running the medical school at what he perceives as a small country bumpkin university, which was Harvard, by the way. <laughs> but he was, uh, thank you, Matt, for confirming that. So, yeah, he's, um, he's tough to deal with. And he writes a lot of outspoken papers, blah, 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 blah. He also supports Thompsonian medicine, Samuel Thompson. All, I said many doctors didn't agree with Samuel Thompson. Well, Waterhouse does. And that's how I, as I said, stumbled onto Samuel Thompson. He is a supporter of Thompsonian medicine and writes in favor of it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, he is an early outspoken opponent of the Essex Junto. If you watched the uh, Theophilus Parsons video I made yesterday, definitely check that out if you haven't, because uh, the Essex Junto is really interesting. Um, but he's against it, as is John Adams and John Hancock. And then he ends up working uh, as one of the leading overseers of hospitals during the War of 1812. He's appointed by President James Madison to oversee, I believe it was the hospitals in New England were under his command. Not his command, but his guidance. And then, uh, after his release in 1820, Waterhouse basically becomes an author. and starts writing about a wide variety of topics and is super respected, despite the fact people don't like him. Oh, and I did forget to mention that he actually he resigns from Harvard just before he, the War of 1812, uh, although it does seem like he was forced out because he's, as I said, had a little fringe beliefs and was kind of a jerk. And it seems, this is my perspective, I haven't researched this too much, but from my perspective, it does seem that a lot of the reaction to the Thompsonian medicine, and as we were saying before, Massachusetts making its first laws against, were not making its first laws about licensing doctors, were both against Samuel Thompson, and a little bit about Dr. Waterhouse, who was, again, not a lot of fun to deal with. Um, and then eventually passed away in 1846 at the age of 92. I'm going to take a sip of water while we get over to our final founder of the week. And, and I'm also looking over here. Samuel Nicholas. Really fun guy. Uh, huge, disco huge discoveries and everything. Yeah, Troy. It's like a, what's so much fun about this time period is like not only is it the age of revolutions, but like this is the peak of the Enlightenment just as it's about to hit industrialization. So, you know, from the... From my perspective, the peak of the Enlightenment is the Declaration of Independence. It's 200 years of enlightened thought culminating into this one document. Then put on top of that, they have the United States Constitution, which has been emulated worldwide for centuries. Um, uh, and then you have these advances in medicine. You know, on the eve of the Constitutional Convention, you got uh, Tench Koch uh, giving speeches about... Uh, mechanization and like literally talking about steam power. There's a gentleman, Josiah Hornblower, who moved to America just before the American Revolution to build the first American steam powered machines. Like, super cool. <laughs> Anywho, so let's talk about the father of the United States Marine Corps. Now, I have not seen him called the father of the United States Marine Corps, I called him that. Because it fit in the thumbnail here. <laughs> a better way to say it is he is the first commandant of the United States Marine Corps. Other people could arguably be called the father because it was created by the Continental Congress. Uh, and the Marine Department. So those gentlemen could all be... There's a cat coming in. If you hear creaking, it's a cat saying hi. There's a few gentlemen and the door's closed. Okay. <laughs> that was strange not a ghost it's my spouse trying to keep me quiet for the kids anyway i'm calling him the father of the marine corps and i'm gonna tell you why it's because he put together the whole marine corps he might not have created it he wasn't in the continental congress he was uh, <clears throat> the son of a pretty successful blacksmith in philadelphia who because his uncle had actually served as mayor of philadelphia well before the revolution samuel Nichol samuel nicholas was able to get a good education he went to the college of philadelphia we were just discussing and then he graduated college and he became the proprietor of a tavern which i cannot pronounce and i saw matt laugh at this earlier and i can't say it i believe it's pronounced conestogo wagon 
the the something wagon, the Conestogo wagon, I believe. So he's he's running this bar and an inn as taverns were used at the time. He becomes close with many. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, blew my mind. The Marine Corps teaches Ton Tavern. Oh man, you were in the Marines. That's right. Oh, is that what you were laughing at? We can talk about that because Ton Tavern came up a few times. Um, I heard arguments about where the recruitment initially started, but I did see the recruitment started at the Ton Tavern, but that Nichols actually ran the Conestogo wagon. I saw both of these. I saw both names. Uh, this is the one I was given. I, I found that he actually was the proprietor of. So, but let me say this. He was not only a tavern owner, that's how he knew some of the wealthy people <clears throat> from Philadelphia, but he also went to the College of Philadelphia. And he was a ranking member in many of the hunting clubs. And the hunting clubs were generally for wealthy people. Uh, and, okay, it's kind of eluding my brain here, um, but I believe it was he joined the hunting... No, he joined the fishing club that was in existence and then helped start the hunting club. Or maybe I have those backwards. But either way, he was a heavy participant in both. And people knew him as a hunter and fisherman. And the one of those two clubs met at the Tun Tavern all the time. And the other one seems to have met at the Conestogo Wagon most of the time. Because he owned that one. <laughs> um, anyway, the American Revolution breaks out, and in the November of seventeen ninety in November of seventeen seventy five, they are they create you know, first they create a navy, then they create a Marine Corps, and they're like, We need someone to put this together and they tap their friend, Samuel Nicholas, and they say, Hey, put the Marine Corps together. Now I'm under the impression that he went to the Ton Tavern to recruit more of the men. And that was the, have the first recruitment place. Now, I did not put a lot of time into researching the difference between the two taverns. Um, part of me assumes, based on what we're saying right now, that maybe the Conestogo, the Conestogo wagon was for a little bit more for the wealthier crowd. Uh, and that's how they knew him. Uh, meanwhile, if the recruitment was getting done at the Ton Tavern, it was probably for your more, we'll say, average citizen. Um, though, again, I'm not sure. That is a total assumption on my part. Just feels like it's right. <laughs> but I do want to put a caveat. That is just my feeling. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to say it. Either way, this guy, Samuel Nichols, Samuel Nicholas, recruits, as Matt knows, as a Marine, <laughs> the 1st Marine Corps. Uh, the Marine Corps throughout the war... Uh, never seems to have made it to 2,000 people. Uh, and again, the Marine Corps, for those people who are not familiar, and truthfully, I'm not that familiar. I was never in the Marines, uh, obviously. <laughs> uh, but the Marine Corps is essentially, or at least at this time, was essentially the aquatic infantry. They weren't really army or militia who fought on the ground. They weren't cavalry who rode horses or dragoons who rode horses. And they weren't really the Navy because the Navy sailed the boats and carried cargo and shot cannons and invaded other boats. They did jump on other boats when there was fighting. Uh, but the Marines were supposed to move on water to land where they would fight. So he gets these Marines together, signs up a whole bunch of them, and they get on the boat of Essex Hopkins. Essex Hopkins was from Rhode Island. His brother Stephen Hopkins signed the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he's the one with the shaky hand that says, uh, uh, my hand trembles, but my heart does not. Essex Hopkins was put in charge as first Commodore of the United States Navy. And in his first fleet that goes out, well, the Marines get on board and they go to Nassau. Well, at the time they called it New Providence, but it's the Caribbean island today of Nassau. And they go there and they start a raid. And what's his name? Um... <laughs> Thanks, Misfit. So they get, uh, uh, what's his name? Nicholas jumps off the boat and brings his men and they raid Nassau. And this is the first time that United States Marines have ever set foot on foreign soil. Which 
like it or not, has happened a significant number of times ever since. Um, and uh, they do a good job. There was a little bit of warning. The British get the gunpowder away. So they don't get the gunpowder they were after, but they do take other supplies. Uh, and then they go back to Rhode Island for a while. And on the way back, they capture a few ships, which uh, Nicholas and his Marine boys were helped out with, captured some of those boats. Uh, he then, Nicholas takes some letters from Essex Hopkins to Philadelphia. And while he's there, he expects to go back, but he doesn't. They say, stay here and do some recruiting. And he does that a little bit. And then he says, hey, can I go help Washington at... Uh, across the Delaware, and they're like, yeah, go ahead. So Nicholas brings a bunch of his friends, his friends, his men, to New Jersey. Unfortunately, he's with John Cadwallader, who are supposed to go further south and cross the Delaware, Delaware and meet them up further. Um, and then because of icy conditions, they don't actually make it, that group. He would end up par participating in some of the battles um, in New Jersey, and then he went back to the Continental Congress, gave them some information, and said, I'm going to go back with Washington, and they were like, no, 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 you stay here and recruit more Marines, and he's like, ah, but he does, because, you know, he's a good guy, and he recruits all of the original Marines, and he is in charge of the Marines, it seems like he, he basically stops fighting after that, in like 1781, but he is the only person in charge of the Marines, the only commandant uh, of the Marines throughout the American Revolutionary War, 1775 to 1783. And actually, they get rid of the Marines after that. They get rid of most of the Continental Army after that for a while. And it does, isn't It is brought back until the Quasi-War with France under President John Adams in 1798, 15 years later. Technically, that's when the United States Marines begin. Technically, you could make someone at that time father of the Marine Corps. Um, but as apparently Matt will attest to you, um, uh, Samuel Nicholas is considered the first commandant of the Marines, uh, and he also seems to be, from my perspective, uh, trademark <laughs> father of the United States Marine Corps, uh, and just one of those really overlooked dudes that I like to talk about. That's why I have this channel. <laughs> so, where are we? We're at 59. We have 40 seconds to hit an hour. I know I missed a lot of the conversation today. I, I, I think you guys are having like a fun conversation. That's amazing. I tried to catch what I can. I moved the comments over here because <laughs> um, the new program I use doesn't load them in automatically, but it's better because I'm using the YouTube comments and I won't miss anything like I've done in the past. Yada, yada, yada. You like the thumbnails? Thank you so much, Troy. You're the best. Uh, thank you all for your support, for watching. Um, I'm, 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 I'm having fun and put a lot of work in. Like I said, I finally figured out how to have a guest to do an interview, to watch for them. They're coming. I just need to um, get the like design back. Like, notice there's nothing here anymore. It doesn't say founder of the day down here anymore. I had to like do a bunch of uninstall. The problem was I had to uninstall everything and reinstall it. So I lost all my stuff. But it's going to be sweet. Did you guys see that flicker? Or is that just me? Okay, either way. You guys are the best. Thank you for watching. We've just hit an hour. These are the founders of the week. Uh, you guys are the founders of my heart or whatever. That was something not so cheesy. I will be back with another video for you tomorrow. And we're getting back to trivia on Friday. I know it's New Year's Day, but it's not New Year's Eve. So whatever. We're going to do trivia on Friday. You guys are the best. Uh, you saw the flicker? Well, pretend you didn't. <laughs> There's not a lot I can do. But thank you for letting me know, Misfit. Um... I don't know how to end the stream because <laughs> um, I have this new setup uh, and I sure hope it recorded to YouTube. We're going to have to assume if not, this is a one time only thing. So uh, I'm out of here. Oh, yeah, that's right, Ashley. Happy New Year. And uh, round 